Hey, this is Brandon Crawford from the San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to TortureCast. You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. With hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, Ben Lee, and Eric Nathanson. Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball, the San Francisco Giants. This is Torture Cast. It's Monday, August 19th, 2019, and this is episode 176 of the TorchCast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. I'm your host, Chad King, and joining me today is Eric Nathanson, as always. How you doing, buddy? I, I'm, I'm a little shocked. I didn't realize we're up to 176. That means that you and I have been doing the two-man tag team for like almost 100 episodes now, it feels like. God, yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? And uh, it's <laughs> funny, I look back at... Some of our download stats and everything, and this doesn't include all the little interviews that I've posted over the years, uh, the bonus sods that I used to do with uh, Willie, and uh, yeah, we're well over 200 uh, downloadable bits of content for all of you out there in case you want to go revisit our World Series uh, Victory podcast from 2012 and 2014 or various bonus sods at where we were getting drunk at a bar. Um, those were fun episodes, by the way. I really yeah. miss those days. I really yeah, miss the- those days. The Kirk Reader episode was my first appearance, so just, I don't know, when you said 176, something clicked in, so thanks to the fans <laughs> who continue to download this this podcast and continue to listen, uh, because Giants baseball, it, it, as much as they've been winning, is still a bit of torture. There were some torturous games over the past week, and we'll we'll get into that. They're 4-2 and two since we last recorded last week. They're 63-62 and 62 overall, three and a half games back of the the second wild card and i think it's 19 and a half back of the dodgers yeah Yeah, it doesn't matter anymore (laughs) no no nobody is looking for yeah 18 and a half of the dodgers Ooh, nobody is looking the dodgers are going to clinch the division uh sometime in the september beginning of september so at least they're not the orioles who have already been eliminated from their division have they actually officially been eliminated that that is just wow wow yeah I know Detroit's having another awful year as well. Um, man, I just – hey, at least this isn't the Baltimore Orioles podcast. I'm just saying. Yeah, right. It could be worse. You know, uh, we, we were. We were sitting here talking at the beginning of the year like this isn't going to be a good season. Uh, you know, I mean maybe we sound a little down about the Giants, but they've given us so much excitement and so much fun over this season that it's been so much easier to do a podcast than personally I expected. No, absolutely. I, I, again, I don't think the expectation is that they're going to make the playoffs, and we'll talk about it, but they're four and a, or three and a half back of the wild card. They got the Phillies, Mets, Brewers, Cubs slash Cardinals uh, ahead of them, and it's it's going to be a tough road. Uh, the Giants, again, have to play. I think I was tweeting it out the other day before, before yesterday's game, and uh, reasonably they should shoot for, you know, I'd say 87, 88 wins is probably around the ballpark. I know that the average number of wins – for the second wild card since the uh, wild card expanded in 2012 is 89.7 or something like that. It's close to 89.90 wins. Uh, that includes those several years in which the wild card had 95 and one year they had 97 wins. No one in this this bulk of teams is getting the 97 wins this year. So I think wow. we can pretty much feel assured that y- it's not going to require that. Uh, but out of these five or so teams that are competing for that second wild card, there's always going to be one or two that play really well and get hot. Obviously, we hope that's the Giants. But in order to get to those 88 wins or so, they got to play six, six, seven ball the rest of the way. They got to win two out of three every time, every week, two out of three, two out of three, two out of three to get to 88. And that's still not a guarantee because if one of these teams, you know, like, for example, they're three and a half games behind the Cubs. Let's say the Cubs claim the second wild card spot, but they got a four loss. They're, they're four back in the loss column, by the way. They, you know, play sp- 600 ball or 620 ball they would still beat the giants so that's why this is going to be a tough road and the giants do play the cubs this week uh and they play the cardinals in september but that's really it they don't control too much of their destiny and one of those two teams is going to win the central it looks like so uh you know they got to do what they can but a lot of it's going to be out of their hands 
Yeah, it, it, you mentioned looking at the schedule, Cubs and Cards. We just talked about how they had all these teams in front of us that they got to play, and that was before the Washington and Philly and Arizona series. And, you know, that Washington series a couple of weeks ago is really just sticking out as getting swept really, really hurt their chances because with 37 games remaining, you're talking about they need to win – you know, they're at 63, so they need to win, like, at least 22 of them to get to 85 wins. So that's 22 and 15. So maybe they need to win 25 of them, and that puts them at 25 and 12, which is not easy to do at all. Like you said, it's 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 25 divided by 37. It's 676 yep. uh, the rest of the way, which is difficult for any team to sustain over any stretch of time. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. They could I mean, have another. The <laughs> they they could have another July and blow it out of the water, but I don't think we can expect that. That was just one of those incredible months. But I will say though, in August they started what two and six or two and seven after the trade deadline, and since then they've been six and two. So yeah, I believe they're eight, eight, nine, yeah. eight and nine now in August. Which uh, you know last last night's game was a bit of a dud, and and we'll get to that. Uh, but hey, uh, eleven more wins for Bochi to reach two thousand. I think we can officially say that that's gonna happen. I don't think they're gonna win 10 or fewer games in the next six weeks. Knock on wood. Look what they did last year, by the way. Remember the right. egg that they laid in August and September last year. They were, had a very similar record to where they are now. I think they were a, a game or two under 500 last year at this point, uh, and they started that just precipitous slide um, and just finished yeah, way they, out of the race. Yeah, they were at 500 when August ended last season, and then they won five games in the month of September. Oh, my which... God. They were at 500 at the end of the month, huh? Wow. Yep, incredible. And I believe it was five games during the uh, the month of September, which is not going to happen this year. It's totally a different team. Bochi is looking to go out on top. You know, he's enjoying this last little run. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, they won five games in the month of September last year. That's incredible. Man, the yeah. anti, the opposite July that they had this year. <laughs> yeah, they were 68 and 68 heading into August, and then they finished – 73 and whatever. I, oh, I can't even do the math. That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, I will say this, though. They are now guaranteed of not being able to lose 100 games. We know that. <laughs> not well, that that was true. in the cards. I, but we thought I, about I mean, that at the beginning of the year. We thought, you know, we don't know where this team is headed. You know, could are they – we were thinking <laughs> – oh, oh, sorry about my <laughs> – I'll have to close my blinds. Give me a second. What? That's what was so surprising to me. Um, I mentioned the early beginning of the year earlier because we were. We didn't think they would get to 11 more wins for Bochi. We didn't think they'd have a shot at 500. And here we are hitting the last six weeks of the season, and they have the chance to do all of that yeah. and actually sneak into the playoffs. So, I mean, I can't believe we're talking about meaningful baseball here in the third week in August. It was not something I expected. We figured we'd be talking about the race for the first draft pick, you know, and that's a credit to everybody in the organization. Bochi, Zaidi, all the carousel players that comes in, you know, thankfully we, we have fun stuff to talk about. And Johnny Cueto might be coming back soon. He had a rehab start on August 15th for San Jose. He threw two and two thirds, struck out uh, two. He only gave up one hit, a solo home run, and it was the only hard hit ball against him. All night. So we might have Cueto back by the end of August, beginning of September. So the Giants might have a top three of the rotation that is just about as good as many of the other teams that are going for it between Bumgarner, Smarsha, and Cueto. Yeah, and that's a big, big need right now. Their starting pitching has just been, you know, their their biggest weakness, I would say, right now. Uh, he is going to probably start in September. I think Bochi said he's going to have one more start for San Jose in Modesto this week. And then he's going to have probably one start in Sacramento. And then based on the results of those two games and how he feels, that's when he could be reinserted into the rotation. But they're still thinking early September uh, for that. So and that's great. And I think that's what we need to talk about as we go into this last week of Giants baseball is, uh, boy, you know, they've, they've, been, they've been trying after you know Samarja, which has been a great surprise this year, and Bum, to fill in those uh, other three slots. And... You know, atypical of previous years, when they have off days, they skip starters, right? Uh, they hadn't really done that too much in the past. They would always kind of keep the rotation. But now they're they're skipping starts to get Bum and Shark, you know, kind of more reloaded back up. Um, but, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about uh, D-Rod and, of course, the debut of Logan Webb this week. This is These are the guys that need to rely on. Tyler Beattie has been, you know, 
tripping uh, <laughs> tripping up lately. He hasn't been the guy that I saw personally against the New York Mets at Oracle when he went eight shutout innings, which was incredible. We thought, okay, this is this this is the guy that we want, and this is the guy who we thought we were getting. He has great stuff. He just loses control. He loses focus. Uh, you know, Mike Kruko, who of course was a pitcher has talked extensively about it and you know I, I kind of trust his his expert eyes and he said that he's just lacking that confidence to to go for the kill and he's just losing you know his his spots around the uh, the square there so Logan Webb though he comes off an 80 game drug suspension and we don't have to get into that but I'll, I, I will just say though I, I still have a hard time believing any professional athlete who doesn't really know what they're putting in their body, especially when it comes to something that you can't just buy at GNC and put in your body. You know, it's like, come on, man. It really, really was an accident. Uh, but regardless, uh, he served his time and he had incredible uh, stats down in Richmond, had a great start in Sacramento, and boom, called up to the big leagues and he threw pretty well after that first inning against the Diamondbacks. So these are the young kids they have to rely on. And like you said, if they make the playoffs, it's not only gravy, but it would be gravy with making it with these kids. Yeah, it's because uh, it really has been. Uh, I'm still Shark has been their best starter this year. Uh, and Bum, aside from yesterday's hiccup, was uh, oh, wow, that's the word you used too. That uh, he, he, he's been on a roll. They were like nine and one in his starts or something like that since uh, June 25th. You know, it's no it's no coincidence that the Giants started playing better when the top of the rotation started, you know, locking things down. And, you know, it's uh Beatty, I just I don't know what to say with Beatty. I'm shocked that he's actually getting the start tomorrow night in Chicago. I thought that they would uh, skip him, mm -hmm. but they're going Beatty and then D Rod and then Shark for this series in in Chicago. And I was I was I was a little surprised Beatty's getting it again because like Kruko said, he's not finishing. Uh, some of his sliders are turning into those lazy sliders that you just don't finish completely on, and then they flatten out over the plate, and he gets beat up. You mentioned that start against the Mets for Beatty. That was his best game of the season, mm -hmm. you know, and you said it. You were there, so it was kind of like one of those, like, okay, the turnaround is beginning, but it really hasn't. I mean, the guy still got a 5.77 ERA. Yeah. His whip is 1.6. Uh, the strikeouts just aren't there. And the walks have been the killer. The walks it's have been the, the killer for yeah. everybody, not not just Beatty. I mean, take Baum and Smarsha out of the situation, and, and walks have absolutely been a killer for everybody lately. That's that's what's been getting Tony Watson in late innings, uh, Tyler Beatty. That's what Sean Anderson was having a problem with. Like, just walks on the whole seem to be an issue for the team right now. And it, it's frustrating because they do have this opportunity – but they need to rely on more than Bumgarner and Samarsha. And like I said, with this three games coming up in Chicago, only Shark is getting a start on Thursday. Uh, it's going to be difficult against these Cub hitters who actually found their stroke yesterday, uh, especially, you know, the Cubs thrive at home. It's going to be very interesting this week. The Cubs thrive at home and the Giants thrive on the road. Yeah. Um, they're, they're literally the opposites. Um, the Cubs are horrible, absolutely horrible on the road. Uh, just this last week, they blew two games in the ninth inning when they had multi-run leads. <laughs> I did yeah, see I mean, that. Of course, one of them was uh, Bryce Harper uh, hit yep. a walk-off grand slam against uh, our old compatriot, Derek Holland, <laughs> which yep. uh, feel for the guy. In fact, um, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I did tweet this out several days ago after Derek Holland gave up that grand slam looking at all of the pitchers that the Giants had traded away at the deadline, and their combined ERA is around 9 or 10 or whatever it was. I mean, they're just uh, – the Giants aren't crying right now for giving up on Melanson and Dyson and Holland, and uh, it's it's been okay so far. But some of that same bug, like you just referred to, has bitten the Giants' current staff as well in terms of wildness and walks. And I think the other night when um, – who was it? Uh, oh, yeah, Tony Watson – kind of shit the bed you see you tweeted out who broke watson who broke tony yeah. watson and that's what it feels like these guys that they've been relying upon are just not um they're not performing to their season levels but you know sometimes these things come in runs and every player you know even a mike trout goes has an 0 for 10 stretch i mean it, it happens so you just hope to ride out the the storm and then they'll come out on the other side okay yeah i'm looking back in the last week so they beat Oakland three to two last Tuesday. That was a vintage. That was just that was classic bum. That was the kind of game where you just kind of settle in, 
and you know what's going on. You know, he gave up the solo shot to Piscotty, mm-hmm. and that was it. And you kind of just like, I, I'm sure I was tweeting about it that night. That was totally a gem of a game that you're just used to your ace going out and throwing. And then Beattie followed that up the next day with a loss to Oakland nine to five by only going four innings and allowing and allowing eight runs, no, four runs on eight hits in four innings. He struck out five, and he didn't walk anybody, but, you know, so his control got there, but then he's just leaving the ball, like I said, flat over the middle of the zone, and and players are crushing it. I mean, the A's, Matt Chapman homered off of him, you know, uh, Grossman doubled, Olsen doubled, so they they were hitting the ball hard against them all day long. And after that Oakland series, it was kind of like, well – I don't care about the Bay Bridge thing. The A's are not our, our rivals. No. But A's you know, fans the, think they that we that we are. But yep. Giants fans are like, I, you know, I think I saw a meme the other day, and it was like a cat who doesn't give a shit about their owner. It was like these yep. these are Giants fans, you know, about the A's. You know, it was like, yeah, you're you're a cat, just like get the fuck out of here. I don't care about you. I, and like, no offense to the A's, they have a better record than the Giants. They're a better like team than the Giants. I have no problem with <laughs> that. But, but there's not a rivalry, right? It's just nope. like, it does. It's it's like I don't know. It's like your sister across the bay. You're like, ah, whatever. Hope you're doing. Yeah. I'm glad you're doing well. You know. <laughs> nope. I hope I don't have to face you for a championship. That's about it. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't. We don't walk away going, you know, darn those A's. They've won more. But the Giants. Curse they you, had a Dodgers. Chance. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, see, it's totally different. The Giants, though, they had a chance. After getting swept by Washington, and then they took three or four from Philly, they had a chance to have a winning homestand with that final game against Oakland. They were four and four during that homestand heading into that game, even after getting swept by Washington. So it was kind of frustrating, you know, to see them lose and think, oh no, here come the Giants again. You know, they're they're losing a game, they're heading out on the road, they're gonna face Arizona, who they're basically tied with in the standings. You know, Oakland just served them and showed them what's up. And then on that Friday night game, the Giants won 7 nothing on a shutout. Derek yeah. Rodriguez threw seven shutout innings. Like, where the F did that come from? So, you know, he's he's been on that shuttle that he's complained about. Uh, and he's made it known in his interview saying that he's tired of being on that San Francisco-Sacramento shuttle. But I think most fans and, and I'm sure the coaching staff is like, well, then perform. Then you yeah. won't be on that shuttle anymore. And so... Hopefully that had something to do with his performance because he was just vintage D Rod from 2018 and he was fantastic and that is exactly who they need. And before we get into the Arizona series, I just wanted to mention um, that three to two win against the Oakland on Tuesday night, which you mentioned Bum was just classic Bum, seven innings, two hits, one run with with this Piscotti home run and nine Ks. We got to talk a little bit about Will Smith. And I put it later in the notes, but I figured let's go ahead and talk about that because our podcast is called Torture Cast. And whenever I tell people, oh, I run a Giants podcast, oh, what is it called? Torture Cast. And I just get that blink, blink, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, if you're not a Giants fan, you, you don't understand why, where that came, came from. That is the exact prototypical game in which we named our podcast after. In fact, uh, you know, Dwayne Kuyper, of course, is famous for. Uh, uh, coining the term. In fact, I have a little soundbite here. Giants baseball torture. It is, and that was that was like vintage Brian Wilson coming in. You know, with a they don't hit a lot, but they don't let the other team score a lot either. And you get yourself into sticky situations. And Will Smith really did. He had a three run lead in the ninth, and we won't have to go over all the at bats. But essentially, he loaded the bases, and then actually walked a run in, walked a run in. <laughs> And he still closed it out. I mean, it was just, oh, man, Twitter was just blowing up that night. It was actually fun to to watch Twitter, not fun to watch the game until they closed it out. Yeah, it was a good thing Scooter hit a sack fly in the seventh to make it a three to one ball game. And then you mentioned it. Will Smith comes in, gives up a single to Dustin Garneau, gives up a single to Chris Davis, strikes out Marcus Simeon, gives up a single to Matt Chapman, but nobody scores on the play. Then he strikes out Matt Olson. So he's got two outs in the inning and the base is loaded. And then he walks Mark Canna before getting Chad Pinder striking, <clears throat> excuse me, swinging to end the inning. And it was like the first glimpse of like the week of, of Will Smith and it was torture. It was, it was absolutely a Brian Wilson flashback to 2010 type game. It was, I, it was funny because you mentioned Twitter giants fans were freaking out, you know, they're going to blow this and da da da. 
And I remember sitting there watching that game, and I was sitting there with the wife, and I'm like, I'm not nervous. I'm good. They're still good. I don't care that the bases are loaded. It's a two-run game. They're still good. And then with two outs, when he walked in the the run to make a 3-2, I turned away. I said, okay, now I'm nervous. Now you're nervous, yeah. Yeah, because I, I always feel like Will Smith is going to get through it, much like you always felt like Brian Wilson was going to get through it. But this is absolutely the genesis for our name as Torture Cast because that Tuesday game was torture. I mean, e- even a couple of the games in Arizona, well, one of the games in Arizona when Yaz hit three home runs was kind of torture. But this was that old school, you know, let a bunch of guys on base in the ninth inning and protect the lead type torture. So it was yeah. a great throwback. I-, I totally know what you're talking about. That was so much fun. And touching upon that, I know that <clears throat> we always talk about the one-run victories. And, of course, this is one of those manufactured one-run victories. Not that they came right. and won by one run. It's that they allowed another run to score. But – that being said, they're 29 and 11 in one run games. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. And 12 and 2 in extra inning games, which we'll get to an extra inning game in this week. But I, I mean, my God, if they were even close to 500 in these situations, they would be so far out of the race. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about the race. We, they'd be 10 games back. It would just be, they'd be 10 games under 500. And we'd be like, all right, yeah, what draft pick are they going to get? So. I mean, this is this is the razor's edge that they're playing on, and this is this is why we're called torture, you know. And, and thank God they're they're on the positive side, the extreme positive side of these tight games. And so, as a Giants fan, you got to say it's at least entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny you just mentioned extra innings in nine inning games this season. 110 nine inning games this season. They have been outscored 42 and 28 is what 60. 70. They've been outscored by 70 runs when they play only nine innings. You add in extra inning games, they've outscored the opponent by 20 runs in extra <laughs> inning games. In those 12 to 2 games, they are t- plus 20 runs. So it's wow. like you said, they, they wouldn't even be in this position if it wasn't for these one run games and these extra inning games. Because, I mean, quite frankly, a team that is 63 and 62 shouldn't have a run differential of negative 52 like they do. No, and this is a big reason why. Exactly. They're converting these close games to wins, but they're losing the blowouts, and that's what happens with the run differential. Yeah, their Pythagorean win-loss is 57 and 68. They should be six games worse than they actually are based on the runs scored, runs allowed. But like you mentioned, yep, and like you mentioned, these tight games – all falling the Giants' way is what's kept them in it, which is what was kind of nice after the Oakland series with the Arizona series. You had D-Rod started out with, you know, such a dominating performance. And, you know, the Giants started finding their hitting stroke in Arizona again. They, they don't score runs at home. It, it's ridiculous. The most runs they scored in a game on the homestand before they left town was nine. And that was a 9-6 victory over the Phillies. Every other game was five or less, six or less. Sorry, one game they scored six. They go on the road and immediately they score seven, 10, and 11 runs in Arizona. <laughs> and and that seven to nothing game, it really got kicked off in the top of the first inning. They scored two runs and it was like all gone from there. How did they score the first two runs? On Longoria on a single. And then later in the game, Longoria helped make it a five nothing game with driving a home run to left field looking like the old Evan Longoria. Might have been Mike Piazza on that swing. That one is hammered high and deep, way back there. Adios, Pelota! A two run strike of lightning for Evan Longoria. Posey scores, and Longoria has now knocked in four of the Giants' five runs. Yeah, Longo, you know, coming off the DL, he's he's looking like the old Longo that we needed back in early July, late June. So it's it's been a good thing. Yeah, I was scared because he wasn't doing much uh, at home since he came off the injured list. But again, the Giants go on the road and they become world beaters. You know, five runs was enough for uh, D-Rod, even though they added a couple more runs. And I mean, D-Rod earned himself another start with that uh, performance on Thursday. Like I said, he'll be starting in Chicago this week. I don't think he would have earned another start had he given up another four or five runs. But they looked like a team. And, and what felt like a really big game, the Giants came out and just stepped on the Diamondbacks' throats. I wonder what that conversation or conversations are like between D-Rod and his dad. Because you know his dad, who was coming to all of his games last year and some this year. You know, as a former All-Star Hall of Famer catcher, you know, he knows a lot about pitching. We know this. Uh, what, are, what are those conversations? What is he telling his son about what 
to do to 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 reclaim his form from 2018. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in those conversations. I'm sure there's a lot of cursing going on, but yeah. I would just I would love love to hear it, even if it's in Spanish. I don't care, just the emotion. It'd be like a Telemundo episode. I, I just I want to hear it. <laughs> I, I have to figure it's something along the lines of keep your mouth shut. You haven't done anything to prove yourself yet. Go out and prove it, and then you can talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I was referring to. I'm sure Pudge is like, you know, he was a no nonsense guy. I mean, he, he's like, basically, shut up and you know, or show up. I mean, that that's it. That's it. Do it, your, as Bill Belichick likes to say, do your job. Do, do your job. Exactly. Right. I was trying to, but I couldn't really get it. <laughs> no, it's like he just got to like deadpan it. Yeah. Uh, so Friday's game was um another torture game hashtag. Uh, it was incredible because I, I unfortunately could not watch this game. Uh, I was out with the family, but you know, I checked my, my feed and my little game updates or whatever. And I see that it's seven to two in the eighth inning. And I'm thinking, Oh, sweet. All right. They got this. No problem. And then suddenly it was tied. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Uh, they go to extra innings and, uh, the giants put up two in the 10th. Uh, they go up nine to seven. Same thing. I'm not watching the game. I get the little update. 9-7. Sweet. Pilar hit a home run. We're good. We're going to close this game out. Nope. The aforementioned Will Smith gave up two solo shots in the bottom of the 10th. Tied up again. 9-9. And then, of course, Yaz uh, does his thing and uh, comes up here in the uh, the 10th inning with a score tied 9-9. Here's Yaz, who grounded out to second, leading off the game for the Giants. Now Dad's holding it up. <laughs> And that one is well back there. He hit it there. Almost. <laughs> and the Giants have gone ahead. My apologies. That was actually his first home run of the night. But I just love John Miller's call on that one. He hit it, and he hit it there. <laughs> well, yeah, because there was, was a like, family. <laughs> exactly. A if... family was out there with the sign. It was just so funny because when you hear the audio and you don't have the context, you're like, what? Uh, but here's the second home run as we go Way on back here. there. Is a spectacular home run to the opposite field by Mike Yastrzemski, his second home run of the game. Six to two Giants. And of course, this is when they built that big lead. This is the opposite field home run. This is Barry Bonds territory, by the way. His rookie season at age 28. And then, of course, his third at bat. Deep. Way back there. Hits onto the balcony. Number three for Yastrzemski. Wow. That was a spectacular home run. It's 25 feet above the ground to that balcony. That was over the 413 foot marker. That's a graveyard. And uh, he cleared it. And then some. And the Giants are back ahead 10 to 9. Wow. You know, he didn't show a lot of emotion. But when he rounded first base, I mean, he was into it. A rare show of emotion, and that'll bring a smile on Mike Yastrzemski. First time he's ever had two home runs in a game, and now he's got three in a game. Just incredible. What That was so much fun to watch him. I'm, again, on the replay, I, I, I didn't watch it live, but to see him round the base at first. and Because, you know, when he hits it, he, he's thinking it's going off the wall. Um, and then when it cleared, he just gives that, Rah! you know, you see his fist bump and the whole thing, and you hear the Giants players chanting as he comes in. But, I mean, the guy has never been a classic home run hitter, which I know it speaks to the ball. We all know what the ball's juice this year. If they were playing with a ball from three years ago, there's no way he's hitting three home runs this game. But that said, uh, the first time he's ever hit two home runs in a game, and now he hits three. And the Giants needed every single one of them because they ended up closing out 10-9. to 9. He's the first Giant to hit three home runs in a game since Jarrett Parker did it against the A's at Oakland September 26, 2015. Um, that last home run we hit was off the bat at 106 miles an hour. He hit yeah. it 438 feet. That was a bomb. That was to the same territory Dick hit his grand slam in Arizona uh, to get this whole like winning ways started. So for some reason, they like hitting in Arizona. They actually came away with a winning record in Arizona this season. That's two years in a row they've had a winning record in Arizona, mm -hmm. which really surprised me. But they, they really seem to turn it on. And watching Yaz in that game, it was just – that game I, – I watched all weekend basically without sound. I, I hate Arizona's ballpark. I hate the sound of that 
it's a warehouse. Uh, everything <laughs> is manufactured. Nothing sounds right. So I always have right. music going and I, I have the volume down. And so like, I didn't even hear some of these calls until now myself, but watching Yastrzemski, it was, I mean, it was one of those games where Yaz had to hit the three home runs. It wasn't like they were up 16 to two. You know, he needed that third home run in the 11th inning. Will Smith, he blew it. Uh, the Giants had a seven to two lead and Tony Watson absolutely just kept giving Arizona base runners. I, I don't know off the top of my head how many walks he had. There it is. Uh, apparently, Tony Watson didn't walk anybody, but allowed four <laughs> hits and four runs, and two of those were home runs in a third of an inning. Yeah. And then Coonrod came in to replace Watson and allowed the three-run bomb to Adam Jones. Gustave was fine, and then Will Smith came in and allowed the two solo home runs in the bottom of the ninth to extend the game to the 11th, so much so that Bocha went out and took Will Smith out of the game in the bottom of the 11th with two outs to yes. bring in Trevor Gott as a right-hander to face a right-hander. Because, because he they had put would... two runners on. Yep, and they were not screwing around. That was a game where it's funny. Again, what gets lost is Samarja had a decent outing again, five and a third, four Ks, two, two runs. But, you know, the story of the game was Mike Yastrzemski and Kevin Pillar. Pillar went, f I think, five for five, or he had five hits that game. Yeah. And yeah. hit two home runs. Four for four, my bet. No. He, yeah, he went for five four. for five the uh, the next game. Oh, on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. He went two for four on Friday night with two homers of his own. And I really felt like had they got it to him again, he might have homered again. It was just that kind of night. And, and it was, again, those are the kind of games that the Giants are winning. And that was probably – Right up there, blowing the lead and still winning the game was right up there with coming back from eight runs down against Cincinnati. Oh, it was it, it was it, so much fun, even though I wasn't watching the game, just to see the yeah. the the Twitter fly and 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 the updates fly. And I had prematurely tweeted out that Yaz had taken the Giants' um, home run lead because, like you said, his two home run performance was overshadowed, and it was overshadowed in my mind because I did the math and I'm like, oh my god, he's got 16 home runs, he leads the Giants, and I was like, oh wait. That's right. Pilar hit two, so he is 17 now. Oh, okay. It was, oops, sorry. Pilar is 17. Yaz is six, 16. But Yaz has 200 fewer at-bats than yep. Pilar. I mean, it's incredible. The guy leads the Giants by far in at-bats per home run. It's, it's like at 10 and a half or something like that. I mean, it's not quite... No, sorry, 14. It's at 14 and a half. The league leaders like... Um, Bellinger and Yelich and, and Trout are all around the 10 at-bats per home run uh, level. But I remember Barry Bonds, you know, he was at the 7-8 at-bat level. Uh, yeah. That's that's where he was. But for Mike Yastrzemski to be producing at this level is just absolutely incredible. Um, he can hit 250 all year. I don't care. If he's, you know, he him and Pilar should, should reach 20 home runs, which will be the first time since Crawford in 2015. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Pilar's been doing so well, we almost take it for granted at this point. And uh, Grant Brisby did a nice article on The Athletic this week looking back at 20 home run seasons and which Giants have a chance to do it. And Yaz and Pilar were both on this list, and obviously their chances increased. The other thing about Friday was Yaz led off. That was his first game oh, as a leadoff right. hitter. Yeah. And I've been screaming for him to lead off for about two, three weeks now. I'm getting tired of the Brandon Belt experiment at the top, which seems to be over. Uh, like, I, I love that Belt gets on base, but sometimes you need a hit. Uh, and Jastrzemski has been providing that uh, at the top. It just seems like young spark type thing. And it, it really propelled them. Uh, and Saturday, I mean, the, the hits just didn't stop. They won 11 to 6. Um, like you said, Pilar had five hits. Belt, who I just mentioned, had a grand slam and, and was all backing Logan Webb, who made his major league debut on Saturday. Yeah, Brandon Belt came to the plate in the top of the second with nobody out in the bases loaded. Arizona was already up two to nothing uh, because of that first inning that Log Logan Webb had. You know, he, he had his jitters and nerves and, and all that. It's understandable. In fact, he said that um, uh, Vogelsong really helped him down in Sacramento because he noticed that he was nervous when he was going out to the mound and he kind of talked him down. So he was going to take that into his major league start, but you could see those jitters, but here's Brandon belt saying, I got your back, buddy, Arizona on the infield. That ball is hit high and deep right field way back there. Goodbye. That's a grand slam for Brandon belt. That has to feel so good. He has struggled for so long and has shown signs of coming out of it in this series. 
And now, grand salami time. Infield. Yeah, so he had six RBIs in the game uh, overall, so that propelled the Giants to that win. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, Brandon Belt, I think uh, his on-base percentage and the whole, you know, getting on and scoring, he leads the team in runs and all that stuff. It's great. It's great. But um, he's not fast. His batting average is low. Uh, and he can occasionally run into one. So um, I, I, I like the change. I agree with you. I think that Yaz getting up at the top, even if his on-base percentage isn't as high as Belt's, uh, just provided at least a change and a spark to the lineup. And then, of course, Belt has responded with a uh, better performance down in the seven or eight hole. So it's it's been good overall. Yeah, I'm trying to find the stat, and I can't. But uh, it's weird how many grand slams the Giants have hit this year. Uh, yeah. Longo had an opportunity later in the same inning. The Giants had the chance to hit two grand slams in the same inning, but Longo could only muster a sacrifice fly. <laughs> it, it was just – it was something else. And, you know – you mentioned Logan Webb was shaky in that first inning, and it didn't help that uh, Aramis Garcia just couldn't couldn't track down a pop up over his head. Uh, it was the type of play where right when it happened, everybody's like, "Belt would have had that," but uh, yeah, the pop up fell in because Belt was, I think, playing left at that time. Um, the pop up fell in. He gave up an earned run. One one run was unearned, and then the Giants going out in the top of the second between Belt's grand slam and Longo's home run made a five two game. And I think that also calmed Logan Webb down. Uh, all those jitters that were there, like the adrenaline just naturally ran out at that point. You know, he, he got up, he bunted, he went back and sat down, you know, so he wasn't running the bases and everything kind of calmed down and he was able to go out there. And he he's a little wild, but that's to be expected in a, uh, his first, uh, oh, sure. you know, his major league debut. You know, he, from what I hear is he's not wild in general, and you can see his slider's got great break. He's got good command of the fastball. Nothing he throws is straight. Uh, his fastball definitely tails, uh, especially in and up on a right-hander. Uh, so he he has the tools, and he was coming off of like seven shutout innings in Sacramento. So I, I'm glad the Giants gave him the chance, and he earned himself another start by going out there and having such a great uh, first start. He's, he'll be facing Oakland this weekend, the team he grew up rooting for. So after that 11-6 victory, they won the first three of this four-game series. And with Bumgarner going yesterday, you're thinking, okay, the Giants have won nine of his last ten starts. We're going to sweep this mother. And uh, unfortunately, it just didn't happen. Bumgarner, in the very first inning, kind of was the story of the game. He retired the first two hitters, and then there was a double, a walk, a triple, and then a single. And suddenly it was 3 nothing Arizona, and they just they didn't have their hitting shoes on. Um, and he allowed another run later on a home run, and they ended up losing that game. So it was just kind of a wah-wah at the end, you know? It was like, oh, just it was going to be the cherry on top. It was They're going to go 5-1 and one this week, which you called, by the way, last week. You're like, they need to go 5-1 and one or at least 4-2. and two. They did go 4-2, and two, but, man, they... They should have gone. They should have gone five and one. But uh, you know what? We're not gonna. We're not gonna crucify <laughs> Bumgarner for it, for what he's done because he's been nope. doing so well before that. So um, unfortunately, they they wrap up the week four and two. That's fine. It's fine. Uh, but let's talk about uh, who's hot and who's not since we recorded. Austin Slater is eight for his last sixteen. That's five hundred. Two doubles and two RBI. Pilar, of course, just was on fire this week. 458, 11 for 24. Two doubles, two home runs, six RBI. Yaz, of course, with the three home run game, hit four for the week, 381 with seven RBI. So, uh, And then, of course, Brandon Belt had at least six RBIs this week. So, fantastic. You want to talk about who's not? Uh, no, but I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, surprisingly, we have... Uh, Dickerson on the who's not list this week uh, since he's come off the DL um, he's one for ten uh, I think the one hits just a single too he has not looked uh, the same since he's come back from the disabled list and is showing him the results he's just not hitting the balls hard he's not turning around on it uh, Brandon Crawford once again I, we uh, should just give him the who we, we should just give him some award this year and put him to the side uh, uh, because he was four for 17 in the last week and once again, every time he came to the plate yesterday, it just felt like the rally was going to get killed. And hey, this it, is Brandon Crawford from the San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to TortureCast. Yeah, well, Brandon, start hitting. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we, like I feel so bad when we use that bumper at the beginning, <laughs> then we have to talk about how bad he's been, because <laughs> he's such a nice guy. He's got a great family, but you know, I like many Giants fans. I'm getting tired of watching Crawford flail and flail and flail. He really should have been pinch hit for yesterday, because um, Avelino was brought up, so they could have they could have slid Avelino into the yeah. um, infield. They could have pinch hit with Solano and then. Uh, not Solano because Solano was playing third. They could have pinch hit with Longoria because he had the day off. And then they could have slid Avellino back out there if they wanted to. But Bochi loves his guys and Crawford's one of his guys. So every week he's going to be on those lists, just like last week when he went four for 17. And then we have the closer. Like, what's going on with Will Smith? He's got four blown saves in 10 opportunities in the second half of the season. That was after giving up the home run to Joey Gallo in the All-Star game. Uh, he was 23 of 23 in the first half, the 1.98 ERA. He now has a 4.42 ERA, and he's just not getting the job done. Uh, his slider is not biting like it used to in on the right-handers. Uh, that was the problem uh, for that torture game last week, the Tuesday night game, when he walked in the run and all that. All he had was his fastball, and I give yeah. him credit for getting out of that with his fastball. But he didn't have his breaking stuff. Not only were they spitting on it, it just wasn't even crossing the plate in the zone. So right. I, I don't know if he's okay. I don't know if he's broke. We didn't we didn't put Tony Watson on here either, who probably could be a who's not right now because sure. he's a bit broke. I don't know if this is a domino effect from the bullpen being traded away or if maybe some, something did happen with Smith during the All-Star game. But I don't know about you. I'm not too worried about it. I think he'll be okay the rest of the way. I think so too. And the good thing to note is that – it's all washed off the slate because they won all four games in which he blew those saves. So yep. the Giants have not lost a game because of Will Smith. They've almost lost four games <laughs> because of Will Smith, but they have not lost those games. So you just kind of look back and go, okay, well, whatever. They didn't lose those games. So it's kind of like a new day every time, right? You know, no harm, no foul, as they say. Um, okay, so we'll talk about transactions right now. Again, we always have a long list every week we talk about. This is the Farhan Zaidi uh, era of San Francisco Giants baseball. But on August 13th, Alex Dickerson was sent to the minors for rehab. Aramis Garcia was also called up for the minors. Then on the 14th, Dickerson was removed from the 10-day uh, uh, IL and then was sent to a minors rehab assignment. Pablo Sandoval, unfortunately, went on the 10-day IL on August 14th as well with right elbow inflammation. And I know that two days ago, Bochi said that he's not really progressing. So that's a little bit of a concern because he's been such a spark plug for the Giants this year. Um, also on the 14th, uh, Williams Drez went to the minors. Aramis Garcia set back down on the 15th. Uh, Kyle Bar Bearclaw, we always like to call him Bearclaw, Barclaw, uh, was DFA'd. Uh, Fernando Abad was uh, purchased. Uh, his contract was purchased from the minors. D. Rod, of course, was brought up. Then uh, Barclaw cleared waivers. Was outrighted to Sacramento. Logan Webb was called up on the 17th. Made his major league debut. Joey Rickard was sent back down. And then Avellino was called up uh, yesterday, as well as Travis Bergen was DFA'd. And I haven't heard if he's cleared or you know anything like that he'll be he'll be sent back to the blue jays they uh they took him in the rule five draft oh that's uh, right he was a rule five yes yeah the giants started the season with two rule five guys um i, I forget, forget about who the other one was yeah i forget who the other one was at this point but he's back with houston it was an outfielder um and now uh bergen will probably be uh, end up back with toronto he just got nailed by the roster crunch they needed yeah. room for uh logan webb and they brought up avellino because of, uh, you know, mentioned Pablo, he's got the stuff going on in his elbow. And there was a little, little interesting tidbit that came out this week. Uh, in, the Giants have had in the works in one of the last games of the season to have Pablo play all nine positions in one game. Yes, I Now, it, as far as, you know, it's a game that doesn't affect, you know, standings, as Stephen Vogt liked to say, you know, hopefully we'll clinch by then. Yeah, okay, Stephen. Yeah. Um, but there was an idea that Pablo <laughs> might play all nine positions in a game and uh, uh, the thing in his elbow is what could prevent him from actually uh, pitching in a game but many of the players are saying if he's healthy he'll find a way to do it uh, Buster Posey once played all nine positions in a game in college, in college yeah. and not only did he play all nine positions in that game he hit a grand slam in the same game 
So not that we can expect Pablo to do the same, but that was a nice little tidbit to come up. And it just shows you how much Pablo was loved by Bochi and, you know, by the players, if Bochi wanted to do something like that in his final days. So hopefully, hopefully Pablo does get healthy and and can't come back and the stuff in his elbow gets cleared out. But I guess it's like, it's almost like what Jake Arrieta has been dealing with and they're shutting him down for the rest of the year. So. All right. You want to take care of the minor league report? Yeah, I figured this week, um, first I want to mention uh, yesterday, Aaron Phillips of San Jose, he fired a one-hitter. He faced 28 batters, just one over the minimum. And and that's important to note because in the minor leagues, pitchers don't pitch complete games. Right. They don't get the opportunity. He only threw like 91, 92 pitches, which is why he had the opportunity. Down in the minors, they care more about pitch count than they do results, which makes sense because it's instructional and developmental. That's the first complete game by San Jose Giants pitcher since Eric Surkamp in 2010. Oh, Surkamp, oh my God. Blast from the right. Past. Right. That's why I had to bring it up because, you know, the Sir Camp name. So tip of the cap to Aaron Phillips. I'd never heard of him before. He's not one of their high, high prospects or anything like that. But, you know, that's that's kind of a neat little thing to do, especially in the California League, which the bats do seem to come alive. So for this week in the minor league report, I don't want to focus on anyone specific like I did with Aaron Phillips. I figure the minor league seasons are wrapping up. So let's do a quick little run through on how the teams have done this year. Uh, in AAA in the Pacific Coast League, Sacramento is 66 and 59 overall. They're in first place in their division, uh, and apparently they play a full slate of games in the Pacific Coast League. So there's no like first half champion and second half champion. There are four divisions in the Pacific Coast League, and you win your division, you're in the playoffs. And currently, Sacramento is in first place by a game in their division with 15 games remaining. So chances are Sacramento could be not only be playing for the Pacific Coast League title. They could be playing in the AAA World Series after that, when the two AAA leagues uh, face each other. So Sacramento, 66 and 59 in first place. Uh, down at the Eastern League, Double A over in Richmond, the Flying Squirrels. They have the worst record in their league. They are 46 and 78. <laughs> they have 15 games remaining. Uh, they're better in the second half. They're 23 and 34 in the second half, so that's 10 games better. Uh, They have 15 games remaining, and there's not much to say about Richmond as far as making the playoffs because that's not going to happen. Most recently, and you just mentioned this to me pre-show, we didn't talk about this last week. Most recently, Joey Bart and Elio Ramos were sent to Richmond from Salem Kaiser in single A, I guess just so they can see how they do for the last couple weeks of the season. San Jose. Yeah, they were in San Jose. Oh, yeah, that's right. They were. That was the second promotion. I forgot. So uh, they've, they've got some new blood. Obviously, it's not for a playoff push um, like Sacramento is on right now. So they're just trying to see what Bart and Ramos have to offer. And the other scuttlebutt I've heard lately is that Posey is the one that may not be changing positions, and they might start looking for another position for Joey Bart. <laughs> That's not a long-term proposition. I don't I don't quite understand that, but whatever. Yeah, I don't either. It's it's a couple years if that, you know. But I mean, Posey is he's what he is behind the plate. It's hard to replace yeah, that. He's really good. Yeah. Yep. All right, so when we moved to San Jose where uh, Ramos and Bart were recently in the Cal League Advanced A, they're 56 and 69 overall, but 26 and 30 in the second half. So again, the team improved in the second half, but they're completely out of it and they're not going to get into the Cal league playoffs. Uh, in the, I've got two more in, um, in regular a ball in the Sally league, which is the South Atlantic league, the Augusta green jackets are 67 and 57 overall. They missed the first half title by a half a game. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're 31 and 25 in the second half and they're one game back. So the Green Jackets have a chance to make the playoffs. I just love the Augusta Green Jackets name. I mean, it's a nice little play on words for the Masters as well as they they have a logo that's like a wasp or something or a hornet. Yeah. In fact, my daughter, when uh, she's 13 now, but when she played T-ball, her first team was the Green Jackets because here in Gilroy, their uh, Little League uh, T-ball division are named after minor league teams. So oh, wow. it was really cool. Yeah, we had like the Outlaws and the Green Jackets and, you know, those kind of teams. So she was on the Green Jackets. She had the, <laughs> the, the logo of the little wasp or whatever on her shirt, and it was, it was fantastic. I thought it was cool. That is cool. We didn't do that. We did all uh, 
When I was in T-ball, we actually did hockey teams, and I was a North Star, which the North Stars don't even exist anymore. Right. <laughs> but after that, we were baseball teams. And as you can guess, with my dad managing, I was the Giants probably like 10 times. <laughs> yeah. That's, I didn't get the Giants until this last year with my son. The first time I've ever had the Giants. I, I, yeah, well, you're in that Dodgers area. One yeah. time. Which You're in that cool. area, so people can't yeah. be like, oh, he's a Giants fan. We'll let him be the Giants like yeah. they did with my nope. dad in Chicago. No, nope. Yeah. Everybody wants like, the I want to be the Nationals. Everyone's like, okay, go ahead. Whatever. Yeah. Care. yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares about the Nats. It's just like Cubs yeah. fans didn't care about the Giants. Yep. Exactly. And, and in the Northwestern League where uh, Joey Barr started, since he's the thread that is connecting all these teams, uh, in low A short season, Salem Kaiser – is 37 and 25 overall. They won their first half division, so they're in the playoffs. Uh, they're selling playoff tickets in in Oregon right now, but they're 11 and 13 in the second half. So they're not as good without their best players, is what I'm seeing. So they will make the playoffs. So that's a bit of a, a catch up on some of the minor league teams. Um, I I will probably be looking in two weeks when the season. All these seasons end on Labor Day, so after Labor Day, from one of the minor league reports, I'll probably highlight. Uh, some players that had great seasons in Sacramento and in Richmond and in San Jose. People other than the Joey Barts and the Helio Ramoses of the world. Yeah. All right, Eric. Back by popular demand. They've been clamming for it. Well, maybe three <laughs> three people. But it's time to resurrect Guess That Giant. I mean, you know, you started this. All right, buddy. And this time, I'm going to quiz you. All right. I won't go too esoteric, but we're going to start with some uh, more esoteric tidbits of information. So you ready? Yes. Let's see how quickly I can get the media guide open. (laughs) All right. Not quick enough. All right. All right. May not be a current giant. That's your first clue. Okay. All right. (laughs) But that's okay, because you're going to get that clue because of the first clue, his birth date. He was born on November 28th, 1965 in Bishop, California. I I don't expect any fans out there to know the birth dates of former Giants, but I figured... Bishop, California. I start with the hard ones. Yeah, I... uh... Nope, that would be an incorrect guess. I don't know just yet. No problem, but at least you know it's not a current Giant. So you can start looking at your uh, Rolodex here. Okay, he was also the starting quarterback of the Carson Senators football team in high school, which was in uh, Carson, Nevada, Carson City, Nevada. Huh. I'm going to take my first guess. Yeah, go ahead. Throw it out there. Dave Dravecki. Wrong. Not Dave Dravecki. That's okay. That was a good, good guess. Okay, he was originally selected by the New York Mets from Carson High School. Which I just told you anyway. But he was originally drafted as a Met. Mike Kruko. That is also incorrect. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to start uh, still some pretty hard ones here. I'm it's sorry. Harder I'm than anything hard ones. I gave you. No, I'm totally good <laughs> No, because you know why? I don't expect anyone to know these. This is just fun to kind of research the history of some of our our former players here. Okay. He's also the grandson of former Major League outfielder Burt Griffith, which, of course, everyone knows that. (laughs) Burt Griffith. I'm just letting you whittle down the names. That's all I'm doing right now. I I just can't. There's not a Griffith. (laughs) And yeah, his really last name does... is definitely not Griffith. <laughs> no, and it definitely means that he's white. Uh, oh, see, you got something there. Yeah, I will. Yes, I, I will concede he is white. Yes, <laughs> he's Caucasian. I, I, yeah, yeah only Bert. because yeah, Bert <laughs> played so long ago that Very Bert good. would have played in the uh, in the time. <laughs> That's in a good catch. I like it. All right, uh, Brett Butler. Incorrect. All right. He accepted a baseball scholarship to play for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, a UNLV baseball player. Oh, oh, I think I got it. Oh, yep. Matt Williams. Ding, 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 ding. He has it. Matt Williams. All right. Hey, you know what? That is not bad, dude. That is like 
some really reaching <laughs> facts that I got here. So if anyone out there actually guessed Matt Williams before him, and not by a lucky guess, but actually knowing it, let us know. But uh, yeah, that was geez, really... That was hard, yeah. That was a good pull, Eric. So yeah, so the other facts I had in here as I started to delve into his major league career, he's the only player to hit at least one World Series home run for three different major league teams. He also, of course, finished second in the 1994 voting for the NL... MVP behind Jeff Bagwell of the Houston Astros. And of course, his, his as we get more obvious with our, our, our facts here, his best season was 1994, in which he hit a National League best 43 home runs and had an impressive 96 RBI in only 110 games. Of course, the season was shortened by a strike that year. He was on pace for actually 61 that year. He became eligible for the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2009. He received just 1.3% of the votes, and he was dropped off the ballot. He's married to Phoenix news anchor Erica Monroe, who is a news anchor for KTVK in Phoenix. And uh, she also is the hostess and creator for the cooking and lifestyle website, The Hopeless Housewife. And they are parents of one child and live in Bel Air, California. That's his third wife, by the way. Anyway, that would make so, sense, yeah. Because he used stuff. to coach, he used to coach in Arizona. I only got it because I remember Matt Williams and UNLV uh, hearing a tidbit about that once upon a time, or else you would have had to go farther. Uh, oh, that was that's the only that reason I remember it. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I started with the hard stuff, but hey. Well, that's... Maddie, what you you did not I didn't uh, know mention is Matt Williams is currently the third base coach for the Oakland Athletics. Correct. He is currently the third base coach. He was uh, doing a little bit of Giants post game stuff in 2017, right before he was hired by the A's in November of 2017 to be the third base coach. And of course, we all know the infamous uh, managerial blunder he made against the Giants in the 2014 NLDS, and he was the manager of the Nationals for. Two years, and that, that first year he played the Giants, I mean, he had 96 wins in his first year as manager. He, he was fantastic. Um, the next year, they actually won 83 games. Uh, they were 83 and 79, and he was fired after that year. So, yeah. and, I, and, and, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, information suggesting that, that the blunder he made with the pitching decision against the Giants contributed to the, his ultimate demise. So I which uh, I wouldn't have blamed them on. I still don't know why he pulled Zimmerman from that game, but hey, yeah, that thanks. Was, when he pulled him, when he came out and pulled him, I was you know, obviously watching the game, and I was just like, "Thank you, thank you." Yeah. Are, are you are you that much of a Giants fan, Matt? Are you like, did you do you owe the Giants that much? You're gonna pull Zimmerman, really? Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, the dugout talked about how they had new life in them after they saw yeah. Zimmerman being pulled because they couldn't do anything off of him. That was the 18 inning game. I think we referenced it last week. Yep. That was the 18 inning game because you talk. Yeah, we did reference it talking about Joe Panic because he was the one that worked the walk. And then Pablo uh, drilled him in. Yep. Pablo hit yep, hit the double down the line, and then I don't remember how Posey ended up replacing him on the bases, but Posey got thrown out at home. Yeah. And they had to play another nine innings. <laughs> wow, games, Matt Williams. Man. Yeah, it was All funny right. because I love Matt Williams. I tried to imitate the tuck the shoulder, the tuck the chin into the shoulder all the time when I was younger. Robbie was my guy, but I tried to do that with Matt. No, absolutely. Right. That, that, that was fantastic. All right, so. That was fun. Uh, I like that one. Yeah, no, I bring it back. Why not? All right, this week in Giants history, you got a good one here. Yeah, I went way back because I knew that this was the time of the year. Back in 1951, the Giants fell 13 games behind the Brooklyn Dodgers. The New York Giants fell 13 games behind the Brooklyn Dodgers after play on August 11th. And nobody gave them a chance in hell of winning the division at that point. Well, the Giants went 44 and 11. No, I'm sorry, 36 and 11 the rest of the way. And it was all started with a 16 game winning streak from August 12th to August 27th. And if they don't win those 16 straight games, we never have the shot heard around the world. Uh, maybe the Dodgers-Giants rivalry isn't quite what it is at this point. But the 1951 team started on their streak during this time of year, their 16-game winning streak, and their epic comeback to take over first place and beat the Dodgers in a three-game series on October 3rd, 1951. And uh, that was... They made the World Series. They lost in five games to the uh, Yankees. They were gassed. I, I'm absolutely sure of it. But this uh, this stretch of time was the beginning of the epic comeback. And it was funny because when I was researching this, I thought to myself, how many games were they up in 1993 at this time of year? And I didn't want to go into it. So we'll stick with the good thing. And remember <laughs> that 1951 team. Because when I looked at 93, I was like, no, I'm not doing this to us. Stuff's yeah. going too well right now. 
I've talked about it before, but I was actually at Candlestick Park on the last day of the Major League season in 1993 watching the 49ers play the Vikings. My dad's company had a suite that day, so I was up in a suite at Candlestick Park watching the football game, and I couldn't give a shit less about the football game. And up on the you know old CRT TV hanging up there, the four by three tiny little you know twelve inch TV, I was watching as uh, the Giants melted down in Los Angeles or sorry in Atlanta. Oh, sorry, Colorado. No, Los Angeles. No, they lost. They lost in LA. Atlanta won in Colorado. That's right. That's right. LA won in Colorado. And that year, LA beat Colorado because that was their inaugural, inaugural year. All sorry, not LA. Um, it was Atlanta playing Colorado. That's what happened. Atlanta beat Colorado all 12 games that year. They were 12-0 and against the Rockies, and uh, they couldn't lose one single game. Of course, the Giants lost against the Dodgers in L.A., and they lost the division by one game with 103 wins. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't care about the game that day, the, the Niners game. That was the only season that the Braves and the Rockies were in the same division because – that was it. That was the final year playoffs were played with the two division format. Ninety five started the wild card, so they were split into three divisions at that time. That's so Atlanta right. was handed those twelve wins. I mean, granted, the Giants could have won one more game against the Rockies themselves, and it wouldn't Absolutely. have been an issue. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. but the, it, just the timing and everything of that. You but know? I mean, what, so a if, team does not go twelve and zero against another major league team. That just doesn't happen. You know, and, it doesn't and happen they did. anymore. They did, and that was the difference of the season, at least for you know preventing a playoff game, but. Anyway, we're not better at all. Uh, all right, so coming up, the Giants, of course, have an off day today. Then they're three in the friendly confines of Wrigley Field against the Cubs, which are going to be very important and very important in your household. I know that is going to be yeah. very well watched. Uh, and then they have a very weird Friday off day. That is just like, what? <laughs> but it's because they have interleague with the A's, and so they do two and two typically. And so they're going to put those two games on Saturday and Sunday instead of a midweek uh, T spot. So, um, two off days this week. Uh, so when we record next Monday, it's only going to be five games. And I mean, obviously at minimum, they need to go three and two, but to be in this race, Eric, let's be honest. They got to go four and one. They have to go yeah. four and one. Three and two ain't going to cut it. Cause another team in the race is going to go four and one, or at least a couple teams are going to go three and two and they're going to be just extending the season right fewer and fewer games left if the, the they gotta race this two and a half three and a half game lead because that's the only chance they're gonna have yeah these games in chicago are, are they're not going to be easy because like i said the cubs are good at home um and the giants are good on the road i'm hoping the giants can keep hitting uh the Cubs are sending out Cole Hamels uh, tomorrow night, who has pitched. He's pitched decently this season, but he's coming off an injury recently. Mm -hmm. They faced Darvish on Wednesday, and I'm going to be honest, Darvish is like lights out right now. Right. The guy went 100 batters in a row without walking anybody when wow. walks were his biggest problem. Yeah, exactly. And then they face Hendricks on Thursday. So they really need to get to Hamels tomorrow to try to set a tone for the series. Hopefully they'll start scoring early and often. But, like, I totally agree. They have to go, like, at least 4-1 and one to maintain any semblance in the race. Because if they go 3-2 and two or 2-3 two and three and 1-4, and four, I, I think it's pretty much over. Uh, the fact that they come home the week after, I don't trust them at home. So mm. I – want them to win these games on the road because when they come home, I'm scared that they're going to go, you know, next home stands six games. So I'm scared they'll go two and four, yep. you know, so they need to win these games on the road. And, and like you said, really looking forward to this Cubs series in my household. Uh, both teams are competing right now. Uh, the Cubs are the ones in the wild card race, but they're tied with the Cardinals atop their division. The Brewers are two back. So, you know, they've got something to fight for. It's not like they're, you know, going and playing the Detroit Tigers or Baltimore Orioles this week. They, they've really got to put together some good games to win some stuff here. Well, the Dodgers have the best home record in the National League at 48 and 16, which is just ridiculous. But the Cubs are not too far back at 41 and 19. I mean, that is. Yeah. Better than six six seven ball. They have won more than two of three of every home game. They're only twenty five and thirty nine on the road, which you referred to earlier. So they kind of suck on the road. That's why they're just you know eight games above five hundred. The Giants, however, have the third best road record in the National League at thirty four and twenty nine. But of course, we struggle at home, twenty nine and thirty three. So, yeah, it's going to be a, an interesting battle here because the Giants are ro road warriors, but the Cubs have the second best 
you know, home record. So it's it's going to yeah. be a tough call for the Giants. It really is. And and in fact, if they lose two out of three, that's not going to be any surprise whatsoever. Especially because Bumgarner's not pitching this series either. So uh, and we got Beatty going first. So it's 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 going to be a tough call. If they sweep the Cubs, I believe that's yeah, that's the there bottom you go. Line. I think that's a that's a good call because if they sweep, they're playing a team that's over five hundred because they're playing under five hundred against teams that have a winning record. Um, but of course, knocking down a, a team that's ahead of them right now. So even if the Cubs were to win the Central and they took two out of three, that means the Cardinals are doing that much worse. So it, it's all good. Uh, they are ahead of them. It's them and the Cardinals. They they play twice. One of them is going to win, you know, the Central. But you got to beat up both of them. So. All right, well, uh, that'll do it for episode 176 of the TortureCast. You can follow us collectively at TortureCast on Twitter. You can f- like us on Facebook. Just Google us there. You can also check out our articles and our podcasts at TortureCast.com. Of course, if you're listening to this, you know where to get your podcast. You can follow us individually at Two Out Hits for Eric. That's with the number two. Myself at ChadK21. Eric, you got anything else to pimp? Uh, no, not really. Although I am thinking reviving my piece uh, from six years ago that first got me on this podcast and posting it on TortureCast. It is a post all about how I grew up in Chicago as a Giants fan. So I think I'm going to put that on the TortureCast website during this Cubs series. Oh, that's good. In fact, I know just what, three or four days ago, I think it was Thursday. So yeah, four days ago or so was the eight-year anniversary of my first appearance on TortureCast. Um, even though that Eric and I are the voices now, we did not start this podcast. That's uh, Willie and Ben and Mike. And uh, I, similarly to Eric, had sent in a segment called Out of Left Field about statistical oddities and little stories and stuff like that. And when Mike left the podcast, they invited me to, to join. But I first was a, was a guest, uh, and then shortly thereafter became uh, a regular, and then kind of the same with Eric. So uh, it's amazing. Uh, Eric, I've been doing this podcast for eight years. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? My son's only nine. Yeah. My daughter's 13. It's like most of their lives I've been doing this podcast. But hey, you know, we started right after their first World Series. We had no idea they were going to win two more. And Eric and I, I think are, you know, keeping it regular, even though they're not having the greatest uh, last couple of years. Uh, we're bringing the content to you. We care about this team. We're not making money. This is our passion. This is our hobby. And we're having fun doing it. So we really do appreciate all of your uh, downloads and everyone who's interacting with us on uh, YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, hang in there. The Giants are going to be better again. And who knows? Maybe they'll surprise us and shock the world and, and get into the playoffs this year. Go Giants. <laughs> I don't have much else. Don't have much else. I had a, I had a little uh, uh, Peter Griffin there I was going to play. But I'll, I'll go ahead and pause that. Anyway, thank you for listening to episode 176. We'll see you next week for 177. Until then, a boom. A big thank you to everybody for listening to the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. You can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com. I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro. For Ben Lee and Chad King, my name is Willie Dills saying we'll see you next time.